As I told last time, we decided to end these programs by having a dozen or so world leaders spend a whole weekend discussing the problems we had raised. Our thought was to invite people who had themselves shouldered great responsibility, mostly in politics, and who could talk about it. They came to our farm in southern Vermont, a farm where nothing grows but trees and where we've gone for our summers for 30 years. It is deep in the hills, not only secluded, but very hard to find. This, by the way, is the day for others to talk. I'm going to try to be silent, maybe unnaturally so. See how small the windows are, and even are a few of the... Original glass panes, I think, blown glass. Original because, meaning? Oh, well, I guess from the house. It's about 200 years ago. My wife, Catherine, yes. Kitty, tells two early arrivals about the old house. Yes. Ralph Derendorf, former commissioner responsible for research, science, and education of the EEC, and now head of the London School of Economics. Hans Selye, Canadian scientist. Most of the others eventually found the house. The county sheriff helped. Former British Prime Minister Edward Heath. I first met him years ago when he was lecturing at Harvard. More fitted to their occupants. Humble, simple types. Is there one of them? Well, absolutely adorable. Welcome. Thank you very much. You slept well? Very, very well. Yeah, Are you subject to jet lag or...? Uh... Mm, not all that much, because I try to arrange it sensibly coming across, and I get some sleep coming over. Don't drink a lot of alcohol and eat very little. Nice. And I find it's much easier to adjust. I, I do all those things, and I still can't adjust. <laughs> my, my psyche is still right. Shirley Williams, British cabinet minister. Shirley Williams was a guest staying at the house. <laughs> the next car brought a guest we very much needed for the discussion, Georgi Arbatov, also a friend. He is a member of the Soviet Parliament, member of the Soviet Academy, and a senior advisor to Mr. Brezhnev on American affairs. <laughs> yes, yes, I had a little bit. You slept well? Yes, everything. A very great personal friend, Kukrit Pramaj, a journalist and very recently Prime Minister of Thailand. The historian Arthur Schlesinger, a fellow veteran of the Kennedy administration, and his wife, Alexander Schlesinger. Bit better, but we're going to have this. Are we the last? In, well, no, as one no. would expect. No, the wind chips have yet to come. <laughs> wind chips? They left before we did. You better say not a <laughs> switch totally party. Lost on the oh, road. Well, very often, it's people that get lost and never arrive. <laughs> Maybe they're coming on horse. Come on, they, no, they, they, they did leave about two. Oh, well, they left about the same time we did. And then they did. Uh, uh, Maybe he was looking at a horse and buggy on the way. <laughs> 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 Tom Winship, the editor of the Boston Globe. He lives in Vermont and naturally thought he could find the way without help. He did turn up eventually. Are you just over for the weekend? No, I was over for the um, Ford Foundation meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm a trustee of the foundation. We had one of our meetings. Uh, it's been quiet for the last two years. I don't know what it's going to be like next year because. Um, Conversation began informally in two groups. Other guests joined, whom we will meet later. The cameras move from one group to the other, and as often in discussion, you will hear first, not a connected interchange, but a series of points, statements of faith. Ralph Derendorf begins. I would assume that economic performance and individual income in Britain will continue to be significantly lower than economic performance and individual income in Germany. And I would assume that there are a few intermediate stages that perhaps one or two countries will move from one level to the other, but there are going to be different levels. 
And I believe, I really believe, that these different levels are bearable if they are compensating social factors. And I would almost assume, uh, sounds a terrible thing to say for a German who lives in Britain, um, that um, the British version of uh, somewhat lower economic performance and individual income, but uh, a higher social equilibrium, as you call it, may well be preferable. What, what, what Ted was saying, what Jack was saying, and that is that, uh, and I think what we are looking at, really, in the Western world is the, the gradual constraining and finally narrowing down of competition to the point where we, aren't, we can't talk anymore about living with competitive markets because we haven't got them. And that leads me to, to the next point that I want to make, which is if the instruments that determine competition don't operate anymore because of the power of companies and the power in some respects of trade unions, so that you're looking at a different structure of society that we used to have, then I want to ask the, make the point, um, what does this do also to the structure of democracy? Because I think it probably does something very profound to it. Well, anyway, I mean, I think we're seeing something which, as it were, lies beyond what even Karl Marx could have seen because he wrote a long time ago and he showed great perception. But that what's emerging is uh, that the, the role of government, the role of the public sector is now so substantial, especially in countries like France, Italy, uh, United Kingdom and so forth, that, that, that what we're not looking at any longer is the classical capitalist economy. We're looking at what people sometimes call a mixed economy, and I think the mixed economy will throw up something. We call it state monopoly capitalism. No, no, you don't, because it wouldn't oh, yeah, be right. We do. <coughs> no, but you're quite wrong about that, because it doesn't involve state monopolies in a lot of cases. We will change, for, for sure. We, we don't consider our society as having achieved the ideal state of affairs. We and we be, uh, call it well the transitional period to, 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 to communism, and there will be a lot of changes in, in, in coming decades. But the changes will go in different directions, I am afraid, in your country, countries, and uh, in ours. And now, if you look, if you spoke to millions of Russians, I believe that given the chance, they would say, "Oh, we'd far rather have consumer goods and try and reach the stage which American capitalism has reached." rather than go on putting more and more of our resources into military power, which is what is happening at the moment in the Soviet Union. I would say that if you ask the Soviet citizen what he would prefer more, he would uh, the first mention not to have war, hmm. which is very understandable for a country which has lost 20 million people. And they would say even, we, we are ready not to have so many consumer goods, but please, have peace. I, I, I think we, we've reached a position where we, we've got to re, 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 revalue the situation, say, as between the college professor and the, and the longshoreman or, or, or the miner, uh, partly because there's a hell of a lot of compensation built into the professional job the, with respect to, to the professor. I mean, he, he does have security, he does have better pension opportunities, better holidays and so on. And we, we've got to allow the working man, the, the manual worker, to catch up a lot with a lot of these security elements. That You know, it's very pleasing for a Marxist heart to listen to different sort of representatives of capitalist society <laughs> out uh, like discussing their problems, <laughs> which actually we have mainly lo uh, solved. And I, I think, uh, well, unemployment and inflation and uh, for me, for my colleagues, it would be a new demonstration of the eternal truth found in Marx about this major contradiction between socialization of, of the production and, and private ownership. You know, it's oh, my view that half the problem in Northern Ireland is, is the lack of jobs. It, it's, the, it's the difference overwork that, that creates the the, the tension, 40,000 jobs into Northern Ireland could probably bring peace tomorrow because when young people are without a job, uh, you know, they, they begin to talk and, and to take true. an interest in, in anything. And if there's some apparently great dedicated cause, they, they, they will yeah. take part in that, even if it means throwing bombs. And that, that's the awful tragedy of, of an area like Northern Ireland, that this has developed mainly because of lack of job opportunity. So don't run, let's run away from that responsibility. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't know that it's more harmful or distressful to be afraid of 
pollution or of atomic war or of the crash of the stock exchange than it is to be afraid of being eaten up by a bear. And since we have no way of making actual comparisons between the medical implications of the two types of threat, I think it's anybody's guess. It's my personal guess, but this I have no proof for, except uh, an empirical one. It seems to me that that's how everything has always worked. Man has an innate tendency to go up to the maximum of his test stress tolerance. You know, like a racehorse just likes to run, and it likes to run as fast as it can. And it will meet the stresses and strains of whatever is a stress and strain in his particular situation. I agree with Darren. I think that what industrial society has done has been to undermine the traditional and spontaneous, natural, organic forms of cohesion. And as these have been undermined, uh, nothing has arisen to take its, take its place. Therefore, you get these kind of tribalistic or quasi-religious movements like fascism and communism, which was try to produce an artificial co cohesion through main force. I really feel that um, <coughs> we must have reached the end of a period in which industrial development and everything that goes with it is sort of a purpose in itself. And um, um, it seems to me that, uh, that all the developed societies will only survive if they recognize that um, there's more to life than um, industrial growth, the growth of cities, the development of cities, the creation of more and more of the same thing. And it is indeed my view that um, many countries, incidentally so-called capitalists as well as so-called socialists, and indeed the so-called socialists more than the capitalists, have made the same mistake. And that is the mistake to believe that uh, the world of work, the world of living around work is one which um, is bound to be messy and um, unpleasant and uh, in many ways inhuman and um, in many ways we've made the mistake of believing that all we have to do is try to get out of it. That uh, the great thing to achieve is um, for the working man to have uh, more spare time and the great thing to achieve is for the city dweller to go out to the country and um, have a chance to go out to the country and that I believe is wrong. That is when I talk about improvement and about um, trying to improve society, what I really mean is an improvement of the work situation. Both groups began the active discussion, the interchange, on work and the ethics of work. Arthur Schlesinger thought the attitudes toward work were changing. Most fundamentally, I suppose, we changed from a set na nation which was shaped by uh, Calvinism, which, which, which by, had the, where the Puritan ethic predominated an ethic of discipline, work, responsibility into a nation which, for various reasons, has become essentially or predominantly hedonistic, where, where self-gratification becomes much more important. This Calvinism point, I think, is fascinating because what has actually happened is that um, in the early phases of um, capitalist industrial development, it was actually necessary to save and to have this pattern of of deferring gratification, of saving today in order to have uh, greater possibilities tomorrow for the individual, and of amassing um, capital, investing it, having growth, and so on and so forth. And you could argue, you know, that a developed capitalist society can survive only if it abandons Calvinism and adopts hedonism. In other words, in order to solve the same problem of keeping industry going, of keeping industrial production Fighting going, you need, you need a different approach, you need a different set of values. I have a, I have a deep personal uh, conviction in this. I was born and brought up on a Canadian farm, and I've regarded my whole life as being an escape from manual labor. Yeah. And uh, so I would hate to, to think that uh, I had at any juncture been under some obligation to return to the tedium that I have uh, uh, admittedly and barefacedly tried to uh, 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 escape from. Which your personality, you see, you did well, actually have that experience. Well, that's a bit different, uh, uh, Professor. You know, if you haven't, you want to go to university, you haven't passed the exams, then you go to work, but you have this hope. You work for two or three years, then you have one year. Mm -hmm preparatory courses, and then you can go in. Uh, 
what Kenneth is saying is that from his point of view at any rate, if you're working on a shop floor on a production line, it's a very dull, boring business and it's got no ennobling effect. Now surely this goes to the root of our industrial society today. If it is uh, a dull, boring business, and I don't really think it requires very much imagination from the outside to see that that is so, then what in fact you do about it? Because to be doing that for eight hours a day, five days a week, year after year, and know it's going on for the rest of your life, and that in all probability you'll have reached the top of the acknowledged wage scale, probably by the time you're, what, 25, 28, something like that? Oh, earlier. Earlier. You could, you could and therefore, 18 for, even. for the uh, rest of your yeah. life, you're Fair on way. that spot, in that groove. Mm -hmm. That really is the cause of the frustration, surely, mm -hmm. in modern industrial society. And what do you do about it, and how do you tackle it? And I think all too little has really been done on this aspect of it. Well, I'm sure work is not boring for 99% of the people. Um, it may be boring for something like uh, 30 or 35% of the people. That's the order of magnitude I would think of. And there, I believe, one can do a lot to make it less boring. Yes, I think, I think that's right. It, it, it doesn't follow that, that, that working even the repetitious job is, is boring if you're able to converse with your neighbor, if, if there's a, a degree of, of conversation and... Uh, chatting and joking with each other but you see the more you modernize methods of production the more you try to eliminate the labor element often the, the more isolated the job becomes so that uh, for example in a uh, in a modern petrochemical plant uh, you, you will get uh, one or two people watching an instrument panel in the control room and that can be highly boring they're required to be alert all the time but they lack the uh, lack the friendship uh, and, and conversation that, that uh, in, in, a, in another type of job might be available. Uh, so you can enjoy work in, in many cases. Uh, the real problem often is, is getting work, getting enough work. Shorter work hours and early retirement may be very, very desirable and should be permitted for some who want it. But on the other hand, those who don't want it, why not let them do what they want? I think that we have to take into account the biological fact that you need the feeling of having an outlet for your energy, of having some satisfactory recognition for your work, and uh, that is a very major point in motivation. There's a lot of things that can be done, and uh, a lot of enjoyment of life, I believe, could be, could, could be secured if, if we can improve the basic training skills of, of young people. After all, a lot of the vandalism and, uh, and irresponsibility of, of youth arises because they, they've really lost an interest or haven't, haven't developed an interest in, in, in wider living. And the boredom of leisure can be greater than the boredom of work. work. I, I still disagree. I think the ennobling effect of tedious manual toil is greatly exaggerated and I'm prepared to go through that, prepared both for myself and my children to avoid that noble... No, no, I'm going to jump up and down. I don't think, it, I don't think it's ennobling. I think that not having ever experienced it means that you don't understand the problems of a very large part of society. And, and I, the reason why I think it's important to link the grant to it, I mean, I wouldn't stop people paying their own way, but if you're going to give a grant to people to go to the university, I think it's, it's a perfectly fair condition to say that they ought to have spent some time in the world outside the straight academic world because the, the, the sequence of school, teacher training college, school, which is very, very common in all our countries, I think it's a wholly bad sequence. I don't think people know what they're teaching. Well, I think that the role of formal education in shaping people in society has been much exaggerated. And I think that this altogether too much has been saddled on the schools, and the schools have become the great alibi for the breakdown of the other institutions of society. The family is no longer performing what its function had been at one point. The church is no longer doing it. Uh, the end of the apprenticeship system and things like that have meant that the problem of entry into the economic world is a much more impersonal thing. And as these other institutions have, bro uh, have broken down, the other I hate the terminology, but 
the sociologists call the agencies of socialization or whatever, it's all been uh, dumped off on the schools. And the school has become the great alibi for everyone, for everyone else, for everyone outside the schools. Uh, the everyone else? As uh, all the people who aren't teachers and students. They blame their own, uh, what, those who are in this <laughs> educational system. Another subject that occupied everyone's attention, as it almost always does, was education. The schools. I've been a student, I've been a teacher, and I know how resistant students are and how ineffectual teachers are. And uh, the notion that schools by themselves perform a lever to change a system is, uh, is, is wrong, partly because their uh, capacity to affect deeper motivation is limited, and partly because they're reflections of the system of which, which they're in, in, in endeavoring where, to change. Where, where what would you say to the idea that, that everybody, virtually every, every employed person, should be required to, say, work at a manual job uh, in a factory or in the docks or somewhere uh, where they uh, need to apply, as it were, basic uh, trade, uh, basic trade training that they may have learned at school as part of the discipline in the approach to life because it seems to me we, we do suffer from on the one side on duly academic people who are prepared to tell people like me what we should do uh, without perhaps a knowledge of what it means in terms of the practical workout. I thought for a long time that one of the things we ought to do is to have a, 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 a requirement that anybody who takes a university grant must have worked in a, in a an approved form of employment for at least a year. In other words, what I think we're doing is taking far too many kids straight from school into university without any wider experience of life at all, and very often as a result dropping out after the first year because they're fed up with what they're doing. That's why I feel the whole problem of education has to be recast. Uh, I think we're still trapped by the conventional categories of life, childhood, adolescence uh, and so on. We suppose education is something that's completed at uh, 22 and higher education fits into the 18 to 22 year old box. Ridiculous. But it's now clear that many people aren't ready for higher education at that stage. They feel it themselves. That's why there's been so much tendency in the colleges for people who could in another time would have borne the intellectual load, but who feel in one way or another, this isn't the time for them to do this, so they go off, they travel, they take a job. I think far from this being regarded as a kind of aberration or failure, it seems to me a, a, so it's taking place on such a large scale that it's a perfectly natural response. We are thinking of um, education and work and leisure and old age and retirement as if they were sort of mechanical boxes. And if somehow these boxes don't fit at one point, as they don't seem to between education and jobs at the moment, then we have a gap and we don't quite know what to do about it. Now, my view is to take this particular problem, but one of the answers is um, to reconstruct the boxes, as it were, or perhaps forget about the boxes and think of human life in, in, in a different way. Think of it in one context. Think of it as one continuing process. And the answer to that, to be more specific, is that, in my view, there should be a much closer integration of um, education and work. That is, when one talks about a reduction of the working yes. day, one must have something in mind for what people are doing. Um, well, of course, the... you've got to extend leisure opportunities. Leisure uh, opportunities. Certainly. Yes, but they have to be active. But those leisure opportunities, of course, can be active, and they can include some do-it-yourself. I mean, no one's going to stop that process. Uh, indeed, it, it would be a very good thing if, if more and more ordinary folk could, could do a century repairs around a motor car, for example, and understand what's wrong with the motor car. Uh, th these are things that should be encouraged as, as part of the uh, sort of way of life. But uh, I don't exclude either the, the great uh, opportunities for art that ought to exist, uh, for, for working people. After all, a lot of things which, uh, uh, which professional groupings and uh, highly educated people uh, appreciate as normal the appreciation of, of, of plays, of music, of, of painting and so on, it, it passes over the head of, of, of millions of ordinary people, of, of working people. I, frankly, I, I know little about, uh, about art, I've, I've hardly ever seen a play and so on, and I am typically in that sense of lots of working men and women.
so that we've got to encourage at the educational stage this appreciation, which, which would make life much more worthwhile. Yeah. That's I just think the cost of change is greater than the ultimate cost of, um, of a new arrangement. It is the changeover which is generally costly. I mean, that is one of the great experiences, certainly in my life, that um, even reforms which are designed ultimately to get more out of every pound or every dollar are expensive in the first place. When you do it, when you change educational institutions, when you make different arrangements on jobs, when you change the system of pensions, that is actually costly and requires a relatively favorable period of economic development. It's quite incredible. They want to take good and bad alike. They don't discriminate the least. As always, the discussion ends with economics, or at any rate, with money. And in the case of Edward Heath, with nationalized industry. Why don't you follow our policy of doing it in secret? We've just nationalized all the eastern railroads in secret. I know you have, yes. Uh, that, so, that makes your point, doesn't it? And, uh, uh, they're driven to resort to septuagenarians to try and run these things. Retired professors. But they're themselves. bailing their capitalists out. It's all the same <laughs> thing. You have to bail <laughs> capitalists out. They can't bail themselves out. But by out. doing it in secret, we avoid all this. Yeah, you I agree with your government. It fell from seven to four. <laughs> It then fell from four to two and a half under hours, and it's a long, unbroken distance. Now it's lunchtime. Alexander, come and have some food. All right. Arthur, having made all those valuable points this morning, come and How have some. How do you some. know? Every one of which I've heard many times before. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what time do I get to Marquette? Oh, they said, uh, we'll get there at 9.30. I said, what? Six hours. I told him it's just around the corner. Which are the rare? There's a nice calculation here. Enough food to stop hunger, but not so much as to send everyone off to sleep. Rarest. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. These are all rare. So this would probably be the rarest. I'm just going to get some salt. I think for a buffet lunch, we're doing all right. Let's go get the specs. Then union some employers and be employed. Over lunch, Ted Heath takes time out to become eloquent on the British income tax. I've got the easier to do before I retire, and that's that, and you take a perk of some kind or other. But when you're the lower management and you're looking to the future, you say, all right, well, I've done all my training, I've now done my homework, and here I am at 25, and what's the future? And the future is that I pay 83% as a minimum of everything I earn. I'm, I'm sorry to have to correct you on your history, Arthur, but I'm prepared to do so. He was selected for vice president, uh, and the campaign was well underway before it was agreed that he was constitutionally ineligible and was dumped. So the fellow says, well, why should I go on with this sort of thing? I'll go off to... And what's more, the actual salary on which you pay 83% is roughly half of what you would get if you were in the Federal Republic, uh, or in France, or these other countries. Do you think that there'll be an emergence of a uh, national health service by the great choice? It's coming anyway, it's, and it's a promise. At lunch, our guests decided to amalgamate the two seminars, have general conversation. One talks less, but misses less. So we're losing the sunshine. Yeah. I am where you look. Yeah. Come on, everybody. Let's go right over there. Let's go over here. I have induced. I think I'll add it over here. Do we sit in a particular order? Anywhere you like, sir. Let's move this around so we won't be quite so visibly on the yeah. camera. That's what we would. The first topic was the developing countries, the third world. I'd asked Georgi Abatov of Russia to start this discussion. In general, I think the, 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 the problem is there, and the problem has to be solved in coming decade at least. Otherwise, it, it will become a very acute and very serious problem. And uh, I think how the, 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 the 
so-called rich countries, advanced countries can help it. I have told about it. The first service would be to end the Cold War and attempt to use these countries for Cold War purposes. Then no, not to involve them in arms race and in the conflicts which we have in different parts of the globe. And uh, I think also the solution of some problems, you know, well, we, we have unsolved problems which, which are very dangerous in South Africa, some other places. Uh, I think uh, that uh, it was not yet really worked out by economists. By, by scholars in general and by, by governments. The, the whole big subject of most effective way of assistance. There are different opinions, but of course, education of specialists go with it. But all of it must, must coincide with, with internal changes in former colonial countries, with creation of, of such economic climate and social climate which will be really favorable to rapid economic development in this part. I think the whole of this discussion so far has been out of date and completely unrealistic. It bears no relationship to the modern world at all. The plain fact is that the Soviet Union has done almost nothing to help any developing country in the past two decades unless it was putting in force. Its contribution towards the third world has been minimum. Unless it, was putting in, unless it was putting in force, which it thought would change the regime to its own purposes. Now, when you come to look at the question of the third world, and you talk about the rich world, which is the rich world today? The rich world today is the oil-producing countries. That's the rich world. Not Britain, not the rest of Western Europe, which has got large trade deficits. The rich world is the oil-producing world which has got enormous surpluses and which first of all doesn't know what to do with its surpluses and secondly, if shown, is very unwilling to use them to any constructive purpose with the rest of its third world brethren. Then you come to this very, much more, in a way, much more controversial political question about the help which you give to individual countries. I think it goes beyond ordinary human forbearance to say, all right, well, we will help such and such a country. And when they appear at the United Nations in a discussion, they kick us in the teeth. And the ordinary British voter says to himself, well, why am I contributing out of tax to help another country? And then at the UN, they just kick us in the teeth and say, you're absolute hell, you're an imperialist power, we disagree with everything you do, and so on. These are really very basic human consideration. But your, many of these countries were your former colonies. And they, in one way or, or another, helped very much to prosperity of Great Britain and made it what it has become in 19th century, beginning the, the first half maybe of the 20th century. I think you cannot say that it's not your moral duty now because you are poor. This is also very relative. You know, if the Americans uh, comprising 6% of the world population consume 40% of world resources oh, and feel poor. themselves poor, it's, it's another kind of being poor than, than these other countries. I think it has to be regarded as a special duty the assistance to this country, of the countries, of, of the former colonial countries. You mentioned that uh, your help to China was a disappointment. What was the disappointment? Why were you so disappointed about China? But uh, what did China do that, well, uh, that was you're... wrong? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this in case in the future I became, I became uh, 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 something important again. <laughs> If I were to solicit help from the great uh, uh, Soviet Union, I might uh, not be a disappointment to you. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, it's really 
a bit unfair to discuss this problem in absence of Chinese. Well, it doesn't Although really matter. every we can... four, fourth of us had to be a Chinese, according to statistics. Well, I have Chinese ancestors. Uh, yes, too. but I would say, you know, we, after after Chinese revolution, mm -hmm. we took it. Uh, it was very emotional and sentimental, I, I would of say, course. in our yes. country. Yes. And we were very poor and in a very bad state uh, this time after the yes. war. Well, it, it lasted for maybe one decade or more when it, uh, their opposition towards first moved towards detente in our foreign policy. Mm. When they criticized us for being not truly Marxist, that Marxist view would be only revolutionary wars, etc., etc. Beginning of 60s. Then it became more and more distracted for from any ideological schisms and uh, simply with territorial claims, with other things. I wouldn't say that many people in our country can understand it otherwise than they need because of their internal difficulties to have external enemies for, and, and surrounding which will help them to bring all of it together. Yes, uh, that seems to prove my point in the beginning. There's a, there's a great deal of the ideological basis in these helps. And if you, having received the help, and you sort of deviate from the, from the uh, ideology of your helper, you become a disappointment. Surely the, the job of politicians throughout the world, whether it's the, the left or the right, should be concern towards helping countries like yours so that you can preserve a neutrality but develop trade and develop industry. That's what I was hoping for. Well, I, I'm trying to support you on this, you Thank see. You I, I think they, I'm supporting the voice of Thailand for uh, neutrality. You see, we in Britain are not quite so altruistic as Tadith has been suggesting. Uh, we do give a lot of overseas aid and I'm all in favour of it and I know he is. But a lot of our overseas aid is related to British goods going to the undeveloped countries. And that uh, British goods, American goods, Russian goods, and so on, there's a lot to be said for that. If it's to raise the standard of people, if it's to uh, bring them more into line in terms of standard of living right. with, the, with the more developed countries of the world. But it's how you do it without pressures, without... Uh, undue influence, not only of a political nature, but, but of an industrial nature. And, and we in the trade union movement are very concerned about the attitude, for example, of multinational companies that are prepared to exploit the third world. And when we try to assist our, our brothers, in, and brothers and sisters in, in, in the third world, uh, our brothers and sisters say, are you doing us damage by trying to raise our standard of living you are denying us employment because the multinational companies then withdraw and move to another Only undeveloped one, country. Well, well, this well, is well, no. yeah. for us, I don't But, you see, if you want to get out of the intergovernmental relationship, which produces political complications, much the best way of doing it is through individual companies. Yes. Because if a company invests in uh, a third world country, then it not only brings money, which is what a government provides, but it also brings expertise and know-how, which a government doesn't provide. Yeah. And it also goes into a partnership with the country which is developing, so that whatever it is, 50 or 60 or 70 percent is held in uh, the shareholding and in the directorate by the company in which it, uh, the country in which it bases itself. And this gives you a real partnership. I said from the very beginning that uh, to have the right kind of, uh, of help, the poor countries ha are responsible for conditions within their own country to encourage the sort of help we're talking about, private companies and so on. If you want an example, that you've got Singapore or Japan. Yes. Tremendous development. That's right. Japanese money, German money, British money a bit and all done in partnership with people who are there at the moment. With a very strong central government control. But, uh, well, <laughs> not in, yes, not intervention. Mm. It's a very free enterprise economy.
Actually, it is a very free enterprise. Only, only the the the, 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 the government has got more power than most uh, the, 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 than the rest of us. Mr. Lee Gordieu seems to have done it very successfully. Well, it's, pr it's principally, manis principally manifested, Jack, in an incomes policy uh, along British uh, that that you have now imitated, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think there's rather more dictation from the centre. I think, <laughs> and yet the uh, the uh, secretary of the trades union is a, is uh, also a cabinet member in Singapore. That's probably the reason. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I never knew you had aspirations in this way. <laughs> you are insatiable. No, 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 no. <laughs> I but you see, to, what to do you do? your present position. <laughs> what do you do? You've, you've mentioned an incident, Ted, in, in Britain. Yeah. Uh, we are subjected in, in not only undeveloped countries, but developed countries, maybe outside of the United States of America, to the, the whim and will, to some extent, of multinational companies. And whilst uh, I accept that many multinational companies are efficient uh, they, in, in, in dealing with labor, they're, they're not all that bad, and we can negotiate reasonable wages and working conditions. There is just that threat that can be exercised, uh, and unduly exercised, by multinational companies, which calls, in my view, for some form of, of international code which, which all countries who have to deal with multinational companies must adopt. Is it preferable that there should be this mechanism for aid, which, uh, which is divorced from ideology? Oh yes, I'm in favor of that. That's what I hope, hope we might be able to discuss. Yeah, that, that's to beg the question, if I may say so, because, uh, and this is where I think I disagree very much with Ted Heath. Uh, if you look at the history of the United Fruit Company in Guatemala, this isn't the history of a company without ideology. It's the history of a company with an acute ideology. Uh, which then plays very heavily on the weakness of the government to get its own ends. And if the company which is providing the investment is more powerful than the government of the country which it's coming into, and we took the case of Singapore where the government is probably more powerful, that's certainly not generally true, then you get a, a travesty of aid. And until we can move to the concept of some redistribution of income internationally as one of the goals of the international community, we will go on living in a world of Victorian charity, which is what aid essentially is. And that's why I think that even the kind of um, a, a penny in the pound, a penny in the dollar concept of international levies on nations, not as a, an act of charity, but as an obligation, would be at least the very beginning of the move towards what we need to see in relation to the third world, uh, as much as what we've seen in relationship to, to separate nation states. How could this be achieved, though? I mean... Well, I think this is a very painful way, but an inevitable one. And the first experience we had there, uh, here, it was with uh, uh, new prices on oil. Yes, that's right. Absolutely right. Because that was the, this goes about, uh, about resources and prices and many things which were produced in, in these poor countries were underpriced and from rich countries were overpriced. And this, of course, is a very painful process for, for many countries, but uh, it has begun, and I think it's, it won't stop at oil. Mm -hmm. It will be true also for many other... ...getting agreement about this. Look, you see, to come back to Shirley's point, what are we really saying? What we're saying is we're asking citizens of Britain or America or Western Europe to accept a reduction in their standard of living in order to contribute to that of other people. But I think that in some ways Mr. Arbutoff has answered that because what he's really said is, and I think it's terribly significant, if you don't create a different structure, you will end up with, in effect, a collective bargaining situation in which the third world will force upon the first and second worlds its own requirements because in the end the oil lesson is going to be learned it seems right. to me much more <coughs> widely than by the oil producers the most powerful argument is power yes uh, i mean uh, let's be just a little skeptical about this it has happened with opec mm. and of course when we produce oil we become a member of opec and then we shall have a very considerable influence on all these things. But, uh, it, I mean, is this, is this really... going to be Gaddafi of England. Is this really... Is this really... Well, they wish to be moving people with wealth. I think, is this really going to happen over copper? 
is it really going to happen over aluminium? Is it really going to happen over tin? Is it really going to happen over wool? It could, you know. It could, but is it really, in fact, going to happen? Mm -hmm. It's a beginning movement with copper. I, I tend to uh, uh, agree with, uh, with Mr. Hees that the discussion is, is really out of date. We're talking about things that happened in the 50s, 40s and 50s. I don't, I don't think we need the sort of help from the so-called rich country at the sacrifice of the welfare of the people in the rich country. We need, what, the, the, the kind of help we need, I repeat again, is investment in our country to the mutual benefit on an equitable sort of basis. I would uh, like to point out the case between Japan and my country. Uh, we both have problems. Our problem is unemployment, though our wages are rather low. And their problem is high wages and cost. So they can't afford to produce the usual sort of cheap things that they used, that they, 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 they produced before. They transfer the production of those things to our country where labor is cheap. We don't mind that at all because that created uh, uh, employment. But there is this. The profit center of the whole venture was in Tokyo and not halfway between Bangkok and Tokyo. Now that's, uh, that's the sort of uh, thing that usually mm -hmm. happens. And if that could be corrected, and then we're quite happy, we're quite satisfied. And we will discipline our union somehow to keep the level of wages within possible. Uh, we'll don't discipline them too strongly. Well, <laughs> uh, and in that case, we'll beg them on our bended knees. That's better. That's a much better technique. <laughs> yes. The discussion now turned to the rights and functions of the individual in an age of high the organization. The fact is that um, in the underdeveloped country, or whatever we call the countries that uh, are not uh, industrialized completely uh, and in the industrialized countries the individual tends to count for less and less and uh, we ought to take some account of how people ordinary people can express their point of view uh, the bigger the organization the multinational company is an example the bigger the the uh, government administration, the bigger the local authority, and the tendency is always to, to create bigger units, and the bigger the trade union, incidentally, the, the less the individual seems to have an opportunity, opportunity to express him or herself. And uh, without question, it seems to me that anyone looking at the world around us who wants to see change must find ways and means of pressing for greater opportunities for people, whether it's in industry or in society, to have a say in decision-making, influencing decision-making. In a way, this is what trade unions are about, or what they should be about. But in so many countries, and in so many trade unions, uh, the leadership tends to dominate, and the, the membership have uh, little effective say. Uh, but nevertheless, the opportunity is there. Well, I, I don't know, a couple of things about that, really. I think that, I and mean, I, I agree very much with Jack about the question of the individual being involved in participating in society. I think the problem is that we've got to get from the situation where the individual sees his role as being one of uh, protesting to the state, in other words, saying to the state, this is what you should do, as distinct from sharing in the responsibility for decisions. And that's, as I understand it, what industrial democracy is about. Yes. So that it's part of this is the devolution of decision-making power from the state itself down the line as far as it possibly can go in respect of uh, individual workplaces, in respect of local community neighborhoods in terms of their environment and their choices on that matter, in terms of things like schools involving parents, so that only half the battle is that the individual should be better represented in making his protest. The much more difficult half of the battle is in involving the individual in the sharing of responsibility.
So I go with Jack on participation, but I think the much more difficult stage is the stage of shared responsibility. Can I add another difficulty before we go on on participation? We've been talking about um, underdeveloped or developing countries before and some of the world problems. I think we should be quite clear in our minds that we cannot solve all problems by participation. And that indeed there's a great danger that people who have a chance to participate delude themselves about the influence they have. We have problems of an international monetary system and we won't solve them by participation and yet they have to be solved. We have problems of uh, the control of nuclear developments. We won't solve them by participation and yet they have to be solved. We have problems of development in many parts of the world and we won't solve them by participation by industrial democracy or any other kind of participatory system. Yeah, but I think it's quite a separated from the people. The, peop the people's future and, and welfare is affected by decisions yeah. about... All I these agree with you. I agree with you. And yet I cannot think of a system which, by immediate participation of all citizens, helps us to solve these problems. And that, I think, is quite a dilemma. Quite a dilemma in which we are. And I think that, therefore, we have to think of other checks and balances for some of the great international decisions. That is, don't let us use participation um, as an alibi for those who continue to take the great decisions without having to ask anybody. That's the point I was really trying to make. If you take the big issues which Jack has been mentioning, I mean, what has gone wrong with the proper means of dealing with those, which are the political institutions? I mean, these are political questions. Uh, nuclear defense is a political question. A question of aid to the developing world and the other point you've mentioned. These are political questions, and we have political institutions to deal with them. Do we? In our country, well... National institutions. Yes, national institutions, a parliamentary institution. Um, if you take it down locally, well, then we have constituencies, and um, within that you have wards and so on. Now, these are all the institutions. Well, then what has gone wrong with all of this? And I think one of the things that has gone wrong is that the citizen feels that on the other things which affect him, uh, parliamentary institutions no longer really represent his views. And if you take, for example, capital punishment. Now, here Parliament has repeatedly stood for the abolition of capital punishment. If you had a referendum in Britain at any time over the last 20 years, there would be an overwhelming majority for capital punishment. That is still the case today. And so you have this feeling amongst the citizens. The same applies to immigration. Of course, the, the, I suppose the question we're concerned with is the fate of the individual in the world of large organizations. I think it would be a mistake to identify those organizations with a particular economic system or whatever. Now, this isn't a new question. No one thought about it more profoundly than Tocqueville <coughs> a century and a half ago in Democracy in America, where he was concerned with precisely with the fate of, of uh, the, the individual in a mass society. And in... In fact, he came up with two points, and they seem to me still applicable today. And the first is the absolute importance of political freedom. Now, political freedom is qualified in countries which have it, where it allegedly prevails. It's limited, as our critics and our, we ourselves point out. But still, the rights of political opposition, however pallid they may be, are better than having no rights of political opposition at all. And I think, therefore, any serious consideration of the fate of the individual in the world of a large organization must understand that the individual is dead without uh, a system which is devoted, uh, however, which has as among its objectives and alleged rights, the rights of political opposition. Would you include the position of the individual who has no alternative except to work for a large organization? I, well, that, that, but should he have political freedom? Sure. No, no. Would you say, describe that as an absence of freedom? I would describe that as an uh, absence of freedom, yes. What you're emphasizing, which I agree with profoundly, is in a way a negative sort of freedom, which I think is basic. You can ensure by laws in a parliamentary democracy that people aren't made to do things, but the real problem today is to go further than that and meet their aspirations and by saying, yes, your freedom is also going to enable you to have the constructive things in life and to remove the uncertainty from yourself and your family. If we're talking about the age of uncertainty, 
then it seems to me the uncertainty with which we're really dealing is the uncertainty of the ordinary man in the street and his wife and his family and what's his future going to be and what his children, how they're going to be educated and what's their job going to be after that and where they're going to live and who's going to look after their health and if they're ill, are they going to have to pay a fabulous bill or do they find a means uh, either by voluntary contribution or through the state in which it's met. These are all the things which really concern the man in the street and his wife and his children. There has to be some sort of leadership which you trust, doesn't there? Uh, I would say another thing that in the 60s here I think that there was an enormous um, movement. People really uh, felt that they'd been misled, that their government was too big, that that their organizations were too big and that they as individuals couldn't affect them. Uh, we've grown, the Washington Post building has grown since I've been there 13 years, um, from about 1,300 to 2,800. Uh, and I, have, I now cope with some very real difficulties because people feel that we're cold, we're impersonal, that, that they're not loved, uh, that people don't want to listen that management doesn't care. I get that all the time. Uh, all I'm saying is that when you do care and you do want to do it right, it's still very hard to do. You have to replace the value of a small institution in which individuals all know each other and therefore can be heard with some very effective machinery through which they can make themselves heard, such as, say, an open door policy to the top executives. Well, of course, we have we have the answer to that in Britain in industry, and that's the shop steward system, a continuous representation system, elected representatives. But I, I, I think you need to develop that and enrich it. Uh, at the same time, you've got to find some equivalent in, in society so that... Uh, but, uh, Mr. Jones, some of, as you yourself said, trade unions tend to become very undemocratic. Yes, but the way you, and the way you want sure that they're democratic is to make sure that there's a lot of representatives selected at the bottom of the, of, of the union machinery. But like every organization, people get lazy and they don't go out and vote and they don't participate. And then, like every bureaucracy, the bureaucracy takes over and it's more undemocratic than <clears> any, <throat> any bureaucracy you can encounter when it gets rigid. And it's the first to prevent management from trying to reach people who work for them. But a trade union shouldn't stand in the way of, of direct and effective representation of the employees to their management. That's what a trade union really should be about.